I have never in my life, not once experienced depression. Like people talk about experiencing depression, just never have. I remember telling her, you know, God could have let me go in the van. Mm -hmm. He could have let me go. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the point is of saving me if I'm never going to walk again mm -hmm. and I'm going to be in pain again mm -hmm. and I'm going to struggle. Emotionally and mentally, I reached a place where I was giving up mm -hmm. and I came out of it within 24 hours. It was, I was, and I've Praise never the been there since and I Praise never will be. Amen. But Amen. Um, God had to, it was not human effort that pulled me through that. Mm. Welcome back to Why I Am Here podcast. On today's show, we have a special guest. His name is Scott Michael Bennett. If you know him already, or if you follow his music online, you know that his music is amazing. If you haven't listened to his music, please go and search. You might like his music. And on today's show, though we are going to talk a little bit about Scott's talents and gifts and the shows that he has done and some of his music. But our main focus is on an event that happened early last year. Scott was involved in a fatal accident, but God's hand was there to deliver him. And we're going to find out in today's show. So let's do a rewind. You remember the, the days of the tapes that would put in the radio yeah. and <laughs> put it on a pen. And then I'm barely that old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. You just made me feel great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, so you, you talked about the calling. So take us yeah. back growing up. Uh, what, uh, what made you love music? And if you can share some things, some events that uh, kind of ushered you into uh, that track of music and... You know, I think music... My love for it really stemmed from my mother's love for music. Mm -hmm. And she was someone who was always playing music. So it was a playing in the house on cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you didn't see it those. Was. <laughs> <laughs> I was really little. <laughs> but I do remember her playing a lot of, you know, Sandy Patty, Christy Lane. Um, mm -hmm. She would play music in the car and she would sing to it. And as I got older, I learned the songs and her and I would just belt them out together in the car. So I think the love of music is just something that was infused in me by my mom. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a certain love for music that has been placed in my heart by God directly, mm -hmm. where he's given me more than just a love, but a passion for it. I think the, the passion for music, the, the deep seated desire to use it as a tool to win people's hearts to Christ, that was placed by God. Amen. Amen. Um, no one else in my family is musical. Um, even my mom, even though she loved to sing. Oh, really? No one in my family is musical. No one. No one in my history that we know of really um, is musical. I think my grandfather on one side played the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> so I think some of the passion mm. for it was just given as a gift by God for me to use to his glory. Um, I remember as a kid loving music, but didn't really sing, didn't play any instruments, just, um, just loved just listening appreciated to appreciated it. Music. Yeah. yeah. I would go up to in, at, at, after church, even as a six, seven year old, I would run right up to the organ oh. as they were playing the post lewd. Hmm. And I would just stand there and stare and just while enjoy. the organist was playing. So oh, I, wow. I loved it even then. Even wow. I couldn't make music. Wow. So as we all know now, you you do music as a ministry and uh, full time, but as a young person, did, did you have something else that you wanted to do in life? And then God had to turn you around and direct you this route. You know, as a kid, I don't know that I had any strong leanings in terms of what my life goal was going to be. Cause I was just a kid. But as I, as I grew into my teenage years, uh, my dad, he was a very successful network IT consultant. So he mm -hmm. had his own firm and I watched what he did and realized he was successful. I watched how much he loved what he did. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day he said to me, Hey, why don't you come to work with me? Just shadow me and get a feel for what it is to be an IT consultant. And I remember telling my dad, I'm like, well, if it's just sitting behind a computer, of, yeah, behind the computer, doing techie type of things, you know, it's probably not my thing. I'm a social person. I like being with people. Mm -hmm. And he said, why don't you just come with me 
feel it out. I think you'll be surprised by what you find. And so I spent an entire day with him, an eight-hour work day. And at the end of the day, I was very in love with it. I mean, it was just 95% oh, wow. people and mm -hmm. 5% technology. And interacting with clients was probably my favorite part of that. So that kind of began a seven-year career in IT network consulting. I began to study that in school. Mm -hmm. And um, music was just kind of one of those things I did on the side. I had taken some piano lessons, didn't do too well with piano lessons. Um, I had taken some voice lessons, uh, got pretty serious at Andrews University in terms of their vocal performance program. Uh, but IT just seemed like it would be the... the the ticket for me to pay the bills and have a successful career someday. So you actually had a full-time job? I did. Like a nine-to-five? Mm -hmm. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. So how long was that? Five years? Seven I did years? that about seven years, seven years. Okay. until I was about 25, 26. Um, and that was at that point really, um, there were just dynamics in my family that were changing dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, I had met Heather who was, I had been known to me, going to be my future wife. Mm. And uh, I had people who I do not believe randomly, I believe divinely, were coming out of the woodwork and talking to me about music ministry. Just mm. saying, hey, I've heard you sing in the past. You've done special music at church. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering why you haven't created a ministry in music. And I think the turning point for me was one day, I remember Heather showed up at my apartment. She knocked on the door and I opened up the door and she was standing there with this big, strange looking cardboard box. Oh. And I said, what's this? <laughs> she said, you know, I was just inspired to give this to you and to tell you that you should chase your dreams. Hmm. And I was like, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but I opened box. up this box. Yeah, because I'm like, are my dreams in this box? <laughs> are they going to run away when I open the box? I'm going to have to chase oh, them. It's a, <laughs> it's a fortune cookie. It's a giant fortune cookie. <laughs> so I opened up the box and there was this beautiful, brand new Alvarez guitar. Oh, wow. And she had known that I've hmm. always wanted to learn to play guitar. And so she had saved up her money for over a month, so like six or eight weeks. Wow. And she was putting money away on this guitar on layaway hmm. and finally was able to bring it and give it to me. Oh, and that's precious. She left me there with that guitar and I mm -hmm. just stared at this guitar and it just occurred to me that here was a, a girl that I was engaged to by then. Okay. Who really believed in God's ability to use music mm -hmm. and me somehow to make a difference in people's lives. And so I think it was then that I realized maybe, maybe this career in, in IT was going to be financially successful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it would not be successful in the department of fulfilling. I see. And I started to explore full-time music ministry really from that day on. So that transition, did you then quit your job right away or you just started balancing doing music and still working at Yeah, so United. I was balancing it for a little while and then there came a point in time where it made more sense for me to transition full time into music. Just, How was that like? It was that was that was pretty sketchy for the first year. I mean it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. I remember I would go away for six weeks and drive around and tour, mm -hmm. stay at people's houses, stay at hotels. And then I'd come back home and I would do landscaping work. I mean, I would, I remember mowing people's lawns, doing landscaping. I painted people's garage doors and their sheds. This freelance kind of work that would allow me to go back out on tour when I booked enough concerts. So it was this back and forth <laughs> back for an and entire forth. year. Mm. And actually Heather and I got married during that. During that time. Transition period, yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot of faith. <laughs> it, yeah, there's some yeah. insanity and some faith. <laughs> yeah, in. that's a, that's a high risk. But uh, did you had some some people saying, "Hey, oh, what are you doing? Keep your job and don't don't go full time ministry." Yeah, there's always people who absolutely mean like well. this is presumption and. Yeah, I think I think there were people who thought, "Is this gonna work?" Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted it to for me. They were mm -hmm. hoping it would work out. But, you know, in terms of logical, from a business standpoint, from a career standpoint, a human standpoint, it doesn't make sense to transition out of a very successful um, 
career mm-hmm. into something that is just so unknown. I mean, right. the starving artist, that whole moniker, that whole term exists for a reason, you know, because a lot of musicians starve. <laughs> I was going to get to get to that. And uh, thank you for for mentioning that, because I was going to ask you, like, what are the highs and the lows uh, that you have gone through through your music career and doing it as a ministry? I think the highs and lows, it's a good way to describe Mm -hmm. ministry because it is a it's a true roller coaster ride between those two extremes. Mm -hmm. Not because God is taking us on that roller coaster ride, but because I think our faith journey, mm. that's mm. what takes us mm. on that emotional roller mm. coaster ride. Mm-hmm. Trusting God implicitly, explicitly, and then our faith faltering takes mm. us into that low place. And then we have a faith building experience and we trust God again and we go to that high place. And then we, mm-hmm. our faith is faltering a little bit and we lose a little trust and we go to that low place. So right, right. Um, I think that journey for us has included a lot of different scenarios. When I first started music ministry, I remember specifically saying, God, if you are calling me to do this, I need you to book me a concert a month and then I'll know. Mm -hmm. Like just one a month is all I'm asking because then I'll go, okay, this is something I can do. This is something people want. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a lot of confidence that my abilities or talents were worth paying for. And I've never felt that. I've always felt like there were better singers out there. But God calls who he calls. And so you just say, okay, like Moses, maybe I'm not really clear of speech. Maybe I have limitations, human limitations. But if God says, hey, I I have a job for you to do, Mm -hmm. you just cannot focus on those limitations. You say, okay, God, I'll do it. I think there might be better qualified people, but you're calling me, so here I am. But I I would just do it so that... Sometimes you can say so that I can prove to you that I'm not qualified. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's our secret hope. Maybe that was Moses' secret hope. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Tr- yeah, it's, it's true. And God, God answered that prayer. I mean, I had a concert a month booked. And then I, really? I kind of like Abraham did with, with huh. the whole situation with Sodom. I, mm-hmm. I said, Lord, if, if you are wanting us to be successful, mm-hmm. um, book me two a month. And then it became three. And then I said, Lord, give me a concert a week because I can, I can live right now on a concert a week. It'll be rice and beans, <laughs> right? but right. I, could, I can do this and I could mm. quit landscaping. Mm-hmm. And uh, God provided that. I mean, we're talking within weeks of praying these prayers, I'm getting calls, wow. cold calls coming in from people saying, hey, I've heard that you have gone into music ministry. Can wow. you come to our church and sing? And really from <clears throat> that time on, within a year, we were booking several concerts a week um, to the point we're at the very height of this music ministry. We're doing 200 events a year. Really? It's kind of where it went wow. to, really. And that Praise was all Lord. God's doing. It was really, it really wasn't my effort mm-hmm. as much as God just opening, opening the doors. doors. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. So do you have any experiences that you, you remember that were like the high point of, uh, of, of your ministry before we go to some of the challenges? <clears throat> you know, I think, um, in terms of visually succeeding mm-hmm. in music ministry, uh, probably one of the one of the most beautiful moments was, um, and it's going to sound like not much, but it just it's a confirmation that God was in the little things. We know He's in the big things, right? I don't right, think right. most Christians who have a vibrant relationship with God question whether He's in the big things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we question whether God is in the little things. And right. maybe we know that in our minds, but mm-hmm. in our hearts, we just go, uh, God's yeah, a little too busy. It, yeah. I'll never forget Heather and I having a particularly difficult financial week. I remember that that week, um, I had done a concert at a church and I think we left with an $80 love offering. Mm. But we were faithful. We said, God, we're, we're in it for the $80 love offerings. We're mm-hmm. in it for the $800 love offerings. We're in this mm-hmm. because you called us to it. And we were committed no matter what. And God always worked things out and we knew that. But that week, I remember halfway through the week, we ran out of almond milk and we were using that to eat our cereal and whatever else. And we were waiting till the next concert so we could get another love offering so we could buy almond milk and do some grocery shopping the next week. We weren't going to go hungry, but we were running out of almond milk. (laughs) Right, right. And so I think it was a Tuesday and my wife suggested, why don't we pray about this almond milk? And I'm like, 
we're okay. We're not going to starve. We just are not going to have cereal this week with almond milk. So mm -hmm. it just didn't seem like an important enough problem mm -hmm. to bring to Jesus. To Jesus, yeah. But my wife thought it was. Yeah, like there are the big things that we can pray for. Right. There's <laughs> yeah. world hunger. And yeah. And I'm praying about almond milk and I'll be able to get some in a week. Mm. But my wife said, let's just pray about it. So that night before we went to bed, we actually said, Lord, all of the things we would normally say. And by the way, just throwing this in at the end. If there's Wouldn't some way for us to get some almond, <laughs> almond milk, milk, we'd be blessed if you just somehow provided an offering. Somebody maybe just sending in an offering to mm -hmm. us or something so we could buy some almond milk this week. And I think that was on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, the next day, we got a phone call from a friend uh, who lived locally. And she said, hey, do you guys have any use for almond milk? <laughs> And we looked at each other. We were wondering if this was real. Wow. And we said, yeah, of course. We love, we drink almond milk. And she said, so I bought four cartons of this stuff, thinking my daughter would eat it. She's lactose intolerant. She's not drinking it. She doesn't like it. She doesn't want anything to do with it. I have three cartons completely unopened. If you guys would be willing to take them, I didn't know who else to give them to. And that's a high point that I'll never forget. Wow. Because here is God bending low, condescending himself to say, I care about the almond milk. And the specificity of it, like it's yeah. so specific. He gave you the thing that you want. If he had given you money, you could have thought that I, we could use it in a different right. in different ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Money would have been a different faith experience right. than the actual item that we were that short you're of for. that particular week. Oh, yeah. thank you for sharing that. You, yeah. you made me tear up. <laughs> It's powerful. Um, it's yeah. a powerful reminder that God is in the little things because mm -hmm. the little things add up to big things. Right. Those little right. faith experiences, right. when your right. faith grows, uh, they stack up. And someday when it's really tested mm -hmm. in a major way, it's those little faith experiences your mind looks back to and reminds you, you know, I don't want to forget where I came from mm -hmm. so that the steps going forward that I take are full of faith. Amen. Amen. So are there any challenges that uh, you you'd like to share with us besides the high points? Because I yeah. wanted us to start with the with the with the highlights and yeah. and then we can go to some challenges. You know, we've had some challenges. You, they, you always do. You have you have to. It's part of that growth. Um, you know, if if I wanted to go out and bench press 250 pounds, I couldn't do it today. <laughs> I would have to feel the pain of starting with small weights and going That's more true. and more and more. And then I'd be sore for three days and then I would mm -hmm. up my weight again and I'd be sore for three days. And that would take me years to build up to being able to lift that kind of weight. So faith for me, I think for us, is a similar experience. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of trial, faith, practice that goes into it. And these faith building experiences can be painful. I'll never forget. You know, we've had uh, a lot of faith building experiences as we've traveled, um, have we, as we've experienced illness or canceled concerts because of weather. Um, I mean, I'll never forget 10 concerts canceled literally in a row because of either weather or illness. Mm. Um, I remember probably one of the most challenging times for us was when our tour bus, we were driving from an evangelistic effort that I had just done with It Is Written in mm -hmm. Phoenix. We had just, I just sung for this month long event and we were on that high, that seeing 200 and something people get baptized. Oh, and we were driving good. to Florida yeah. in the tour bus, trying to make it for the next concert tour. Mm -hmm. And in a little town, ironically called Scott, Louisiana. <laughs> With your name on it. <laughs> With our name on it. This town was meant to be. Our bus, our engine actually um, had a full meltdown. It had a catastrophic failure of the lower bearings. Oh. And we were on the side of the road. Um, and I knew based on what I had seen on the computer screen as it was analyzing what was going on with the bus, I knew that it was a major uh, problem, mm -hmm. a major engine failure. And we were waiting for a tow truck to come and the tow truck showed up and it said Scott's Towing Services, which is <laughs> very personal there. <laughs> did you take, take some pictures? <laughs> I did. I have a bunch of pictures of that. Okay. And uh, the police department, you know, they came to, uh, you know, escort the tow truck on back onto the interstate as he was towing our bus. It said Scott uh -huh. Police Department. And I'll, I'll never forget, you know, they towed our bus to a nearby shop. We waited a couple days. We actually checked into a hotel and waited a couple days for that shop to assess the damage and it came back um, exactly what we had feared, which was mm. our engine was 
um, tired. It had 700,000 miles on it. Wow. And it was in need for a, of a complete rebuild. And the quote mm. for that rebuild, I'll never forget, it was $35,000. 35000 It's like buying a new car. It's like buying a new something. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, I mean, it's like it's your down payment on your house. And we were, we were sitting there in this little hotel room. And we had uh, Emma. We had our, our littlest um, child. Actually, we had both of our kids. We had a, we had a newborn who was less than a year old. Hmm. And we had um, our two-year-old. And we're in this hotel room and I'll never forget my wife and I, you know, getting this phone call and just looking at each other and trying to process to just process what we were told. We're stranded. Our home, our only house is stranded in a shop mm. in this town mm-hmm. and our transportation is stranded mm-hmm. and there's an unbelievable amount of money on the line. And we just knew this was going to be a major situation. And I remember us shedding tears over this and just saying, Lord, what do you what want us to happening? do now? Yeah. You know, you brought us here mm-hmm. like the Israelites, you brought us into the desert and now we feel like we might be dying. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we just came out of a high moment yes. of seeing souls being one for yeah. Christ. And yeah. Yeah. It was a dramatic change in our spirit for sure. Mm. Um, it's one thing to have faith in God when you have a tire that blows or when you are hoping to get almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There's a whole different experience to have faith in God in a situation like this where we were really, truly stranded. And I think that was probably one of the most challenging faith experiences that we have ever had in full-time music ministry mm. um, up until recently. Yeah. Mm. How did God sell you through out of that? situation. So how it basically turned out, and there's probably a lot more details um, in this story, but briefly, yes. The when we shared with the uh, mechanics what our situation was, we said, listen, we are trying to get to Florida because this is where my income is going to be for the next mm-hmm. six months. We mm-hmm. have a tour scheduled there. We need to get this bus to Florida, but we can't do it for $35,000. Mm. He said, listen, for a handful of money, about three or $4,000, we can rebuild the lower end of this engine, which will buy you time. He says it could last you 100 miles before it fails again. Mm-hmm. It could last you 1,000. We have no way of knowing, but the motor will start to fail again. We're just going to patch it together. And so we said, listen, this is what we need you to do. And we're going to drive this bus on faith the rest of the way from Louisiana to Southern Florida Mm. so that at least the bus would be stranded in a place where I would continue to do concerts and we could save up the money for this catastrophic repair. And so they did it um, in a day. They had it repaired, put back together. It was still not right. It was not right. We were blowing a lot of smoke. Mm. Um, There was really not a lot of power, not a lot of oil pressure, all the things you need for a healthy engine we didn't have. So we limped it on a prayer. Angels pushed that bus all the way to Arcadia, Florida. Wow. And it made it. I was slowly losing oil pressure as we got closer and closer to our destination. And we made it to um, a friend's house. We had a friend who's retired, Mm -hmm. who um, loves buses, owns one himself. Oh, and he had told me, listen, if you can make it to our house, if you can get it to my shop, mm-hmm. you can back that bus into our barn, into our pole bar- building. And he says, and you can leave it here for months and work on it as you have time. You could probably replace oh, this engine yourself. That was a blessing. It was yeah. a blessing. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay. And we took him up on his offer. We backed that bus, made it all the way there, backed it up into his shop and shut it down. And I began to tour in Florida on the weekends. Mm-hmm. And then during the week... I was slowly taking apart that engine and pulling it out of the bus so we could put an engine in. I remember seeing pictures on Facebook. Yeah. I said, I didn't know that Scott <laughs> open, opens engines as well. I don't. See, and that's just it. I'm a singer. I have yeah, no I idea like, what I'm doing. Man. It is literally on YouTube and calling people who know these things, just mm. asking people for advice, but I'm doing the work, which is majority of what the cost is in an engine replacement. It's all the labor. labor. Yeah. And so that's where we stayed for about three months. And it took us that long to, you know, get that engine out and get a new engine uh, rebuilt, shipped and put back in. 
and there was a lot of other things that happened in the middle of in all that. Of all but that. we yeah. were able to do it, my wife and I. Have pictures of Heather underneath that giant wow. engine changing the oil pan, and wow. I mean the engine alone weighed three or four thousand pounds. So she's she's amazing. She was out there helping me wow. every day. <laughs> you guys are a power team. <laughs> it was we were a power team, and yeah. a lot of people you know supported us. They saw the need and they financially said. Hey, if you're willing to get your hands dirty, mm-hmm. we'll support you so you can buy the parts to replace this engine. Mm-hmm. And so the engine and the parts were were literally uh, paid for entirely by our supporters and our donors. Praise the Lord. Um, so Praise we were able Lord. to just put our sweat equity oh. into it and replace the engine. In the Praise bus. the Lord. So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, God intervenes in so many different ways that we don't even have an idea. It's true. Yeah, I, true. I remember a quote, I think it's in Ministry of Healing that says, God has a thousand ways of dealing with one situation. Mm. So many ways that he can be able to assure us that he's there and his hand is with us yes. all the time. Yeah. And you know, when you're in ministry, Satan doesn't go to bed or rest. No. <laughs> I remember one Sabbath morning, I don't remember the day day exactly, um, waking up to a post on Facebook, I think it was probably a few months after you had done a concert for us mm. and seeing the, the, the post that you had been involved in an accident and seeing the comments, realizing that this was serious. Mm. And I remember announcing, t- I was doing announcements that day at, at my church and I had seen some other churches post on their Facebook pages as well. And I'm thinking, what just happened? Mm-hmm. So do you mind just transitioning for us into that experience and what happened that day and where were you going and what was that experience like? So that was January 21 of 2023. Mm -hmm. I woke up really early that morning to head to a church in Ohio. I was scheduled to preach, kind of do a preaching sermon preaching sermon yeah Yeah. and so i was gonna sing and share some testimony they had scheduled you to preach i remember we had this conversation when you came to our church you said pastor michael i've never preached before (laughs) (laughs) our preaching is not my thing yeah it's not my thing scott (laughs) this is gonna be your first time (laughs) and i said this is gonna be your first time there's more to come so i'm happy to hear this this was more to come this was more to come yeah yeah so that basically just yeah i think it was mere months not even months probably Uh after i did yeah uh the sermon and the program at village that um i was invited to go to this church and they wanted me to come to do a presentation in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so the church was probably five or six hours away. Okay. And typically what I try to do is, you know, I try to leave early on Sabbath mornings just so that I can be with my family. I can tuck my, you know, Friday night devotions with our kids are special. Mm-hmm. Um, we sing songs. It's just a little bit more um, involved than a normal evening devotions with my kids. So mm-hmm. I like to be home Friday nights with my family. And my in-laws were visiting that weekend. Oh. And so they had planned to spend time with the kids and go to our local church. Mm-hmm. And so I told my wife, I said, listen, why don't you stay here with mom and dad and the kids and just enjoy a nice quiet Sabbath. I don't want to wake everybody up at four in the morning to go and be at this church. I had to be at this church at 830 to do a sound check and set mm-hmm. everything up. <clears throat> so rather than wake the kids and and get everybody up that early, I just said, let me do this solo. It's the only event I had that day. I did not have an evening concert. And so I, uh, I woke up very early that morning, like I said, between three 30 and four. And, um, I left and headed on my way to this church so I could make it there in time to do my sound check. And so I you, remember you were by yourself. I was you, by you myself. Okay. Yeah, I did go by myself. Normally I don't. We go together as a family. Mm-hmm. That that Sabbath I did. And I remember sitting in the garage, the garage door opened, and I just took a moment to pray for prote- protection as I always have done. Right. Traveling mercies. Um, and I prayed for the church. Mm. And that's not something I always do, but I did that Sabbath. I said, Lord, this church, everybody is sleeping right now. Mm. But I'm awake and my mind and my heart is already there. Right. And I said, so if you could please just send the Holy Spirit as these people are waking up this morning and just just let the, the, Holy, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit rest in their hearts so that when they come mm-hmm. and they hear what we're going to share or what I'm going to share, um, that it would actually make an impact Amen. on them. And so I was praying for this church before any of these people were awake. I'll never forget that. 
and then uh, I started driving. Um, I remember when I jumped on the toll road, mm-hmm. I initially had, was crossing a bridge, and the bridge was really slippery. I remember hitting the brakes to stop yeah, at the and toll this booth. This is in January. This is winter. it was January. Yeah. It had I think it had rained, freezing rain the night before, mm. and so the overpasses were slick, and I could feel that as I was coming up to a toll booth, my tires were sliding. And I remember making a mental note, okay, be careful on overpasses. The road seems to be okay, but anything that was in the air seemed to have frozen. And so as I'm driving on the toll road, I'm seeing some vehicles that had spun out on the bridges. I remember hmm. seeing a tr- pickup truck and another car. So it just was a mental note to take it easy, go a little slower, uh-huh. which I was doing. Mm-hmm. But about an hour and a half into the drive, um, I noticed traffic was picking up speed. The roads seemed to be better. To better. Be better, yeah. I just thought, well, maybe that was a regional thing and the roads are probably better now. I've driven well over a million miles in my life in all the conditions. In all kinds of ways. Driving a 40-foot tour bus. Mm-hmm. I felt relatively confident in my ability to judge road conditions. Right. Um, never really had any kind of major catastrophic accidents ever. So I remember... At a place where I was about to kind of cross a bridge, I was starting to then entrance to a bridge crossing a, a small river. Mm-hmm. The road was curving and it curved over this bridge. And I, my, my only recollection is seeing the van, instead of turning, it was going straight. And I was trying to turn and it was not negotiating it wasn't the turn. Turning. It was just kept going straight. And there was a guardrail end abutment. That had these little yellow and black stripes. I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. That was the last thing I remember seeing. These yellow, yellow and black stripes coming at me quickly. And um, the next thing I remember, I was down, way down in a, um, in a ravine. In a ravine. In mm-hmm. total darkness. And I would, it was starting, to, I was starting, the realization was coming to me that I had actually left the road and been in so an accident. So you still had consciousness. You could see what So happening. as far as I know, I did. I don't know that I lost consciousness during the impact. Um, mm. I have, I remember most of hitting things and the noise. I remember the interior lights of the van, you know, the instrument panel lights being on. And then I remember a very loud impact and then them turning off. Mm. And we found out later that the battery had actually come out of the van in the oh. impact. So, so the, the impact was that, was that, uh, was that bad? Yeah. So mm-hmm. what I was told, um, later by the accident investigators was that I had gone through the guardrail mm-hmm. and left the road and the ravine was about a 20 foot drop and the van had actually gone drop. airborne briefly huh. and then hit the ground nose first as it landed. And it was that impact that caused the catastrophic damage in the van. Right. And, right. That's um, a big impact. It was a major yeah. impact. And so... That's, you know, I, uh, during the course of my time in the van, I don't know how many times I lost consciousness. We do know I did at one point. We have listened to uh, the 911 call, so you can tell that I've lost consciousness some, at some point. So that someone call. called 911 or? So no one saw me leave the road. It was, of course, five something in the morning on right. a Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. There was really not much traffic around me at the time traffic, at, yeah. at all, and no one on the section of road that I was. Mm -hmm. So no one had seen me leave the road. I was down there um, in the dark alone and I could hear traffic passing way up on the highway because the glass had, you know, blown out of the van, but Mm -hmm. I could tell that no one had stopped. I mean, I was trying to look around and no one had stopped. Mm. So it was, like I said, completely dark. There were no street lights. There was no moon. And I remember trying to feel for my cell phone, which is mounted on a mount on the dash for my GPS. But it had, it had yeah. flown off there. And it had flown mount. off, yeah. so it wasn't there. And I remember when I reached for it and I put my hand back down on my lap, <laughs> that is when I could actually feel my bone, my femur sticking out of my leg. Mm. And I could feel the warm blood. And I knew at that point, I'm injured. That's a serious injury. My femur is broken. <laughs> wow. And so... At that point, I realized I need to, I need to get help. This is not, I'm, I started to try to move my legs and the brain was sending signals. The legs and were not responding. Move. There was no movement. Hmm. And I was trying to get my bearings. I couldn't tell if I was upside down or right side up. I had no idea. So the only thing I could think of to do, because um, I didn't know where my cell phone was, was just to yell out, you know, hey, Siri, 
Okay. And then I asked her to dial 911. Um, so she actually responded as loud as I could. I just screamed it and huh. I could see my phone light up on the floor of the floorboard of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I heard her say, calling 911 in three seconds. And it did. And it called on speakerphone and dispatch answered the phone. And I spoke to them on speakerphone. Really? And she, she asked me where I was. I said, I don't know where I am. I'm on the toll road. I don't know where I am. Mm -hmm. And she triangulated the location of my phone. And was able to find out exactly where I was. Wow. Um, wow. She asked me if I had injuries. I said, yeah, I believe I broke my leg. And I used a piece of plastic trim to rake the phone towards me. And I remember being able to reach the phone and get it. Uh -huh. And I turned the light on and I started looking at my injuries. And I realized I had broken both my legs at that point. Mm. And um, I told her, I said, I've broken both my legs, which she was in disbelief. She's like, did you, you broke both your legs? I said, yeah. And, She's and like, are you sure? speaking? Yeah, yeah, I was still talking. I said, yeah, I've broken both my legs for sure. I could see my left foot was folded underneath the gas pedal. Oh, wow. um, this leg was completely cut open and bleeding everywhere. Mm. So I had open fractures here, a closed fracture here, and then an open fracture on my femur. And so I just, I knew there was, there was a lot of blood everywhere. There was a lot of blood in my seat. Mm -hmm. So I told her, I said, I'm injured pretty bad. And I said, I think I'm losing consciousness. She says, okay, why do you think that? And I said, it's because I'm my vision is, I'm starting to go blind. And she said, okay, can you still hear me? And I said, yeah, I can hear you, but I can't see anything anymore. And I said, I think I'm just losing consciousness. Because you're losing a lot of blood. I think, yeah, yeah shock, and blood shock, loss. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. So um, she had said to me, listen, we have a state trooper on the way, but it's taking him a long time to get to you. The roads are really bad. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a 10 minute wait before he can get to you. You need to stay with me on the line. And she did stay with me. And you can hear a couple of times she's saying, sir, sir, and I'm not responding. Mm. So I think maybe I was in and out um, while waiting for that state trooper to come. waiting for that yeah. state trooper to come. Mm -hmm. So they come and um, did they take you in, a, in an ambulance or they airlifted you? So this, that state trooper arrived and he was the first person there. He arrived before any medical personnel. Oh, okay. And I remember when he climbed into the passenger side because the driver's side was jammed shut. He, I remember him looking at me and going, I need to get a tourniquet on you right away. You're bleeding out. And so he ran back to his car. He comes back in and he starts applying a tourniquet to my leg. Mm -hmm. And he said, I need another tourniquet for your other leg because you're bleeding out of that leg. I don't have one. Um, he said, you just need to stay with me until the paramedics come. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, I remember firefighters showing up and they were cutting my door open. They were trying to cut the door the off. The driver's side. Yeah. So they cut it off and they looked at me and they said, we're not 100% sure the best way to get you out because I was pinned in there. They're like, do you want to come out feet first or head first? And they asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> they did ask you. They asked me. And I said, I definitely want to come out head first. But yeah, don't know. Oh, I don't okay. know. I just said head first. <laughs> so I came out head first. They, I remember them carrying me up that embankment and I was hanging onto their lapels because I felt like I was going to slide off the, the body board. Okay. Even though they strapped me in, I could feel that angle. So I just hung yeah. onto their lapels. Yeah. And then they put me in an ambulance and then another ambulance had come. And when that second ambulance arrived, I remember that I was sitting in the, the first ambulance and that second ambulance came and they said, mm -hmm. you need to call in a life flight right now. And when they assessed me, so one of them was advanced life support. One of them was basic life support. And when, it, when advanced life support came, they came said he in. has to yeah. be airlifted. Mm. And so they had called in, um, they had called in a life flight helicopter. Mm -hmm. They had shut down the toll road completely. It was, I found out later it was shut down for three hours. Oh, really? While that helicopter landed right on the toll road. And um, they put me in the helicopter and started giving me blood transfusions in the helicopter. Oh, praise the Lord. And uh, took me to a trauma center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you were conscious the whole time. I think I was. You think? You think I you think were. I was. I you have, could, a, I have some memories. What was happening. I definitely have some memories mm -hmm. all the way up until getting into the helicopter. And I remember nothing during the helicopter ride. So I mm. think I passed out of that. I, I remember asking the flight nurse, can you please give me pain medication? And I said, I'm nauseous. The pain is so bad. It's so bad. I'm yeah. going to throw up. And mm -hmm. I just begged her. And she said to me, I can't give you anything. Your heart rate is too low. Mm. It will kill you. She said, you have to get 
into uh, emergency surgery. Emergency. We can't give you anything. Right, right. And so uh, I think I'd lost six or seven units of blood at that time. Yeah. And they yeah, just couldn't give me yeah, anything. to. Yeah. It would lower my heart rate and just, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but. That's, that's, yeah. But now you know from all the explanation mm -hmm. that, that, that you got. So you, you get to the hospital. When did your wife uh, know? When, when was she notified? So while the state trooper was trying to apply a tourniquet, I remember him taking my phone, putting it in my face so that I would unlock it with the mm -hmm. facial recognition. Mm -hmm. I remember him shoving it in my face. And then he, my wife is listed as an emergency contact. So he, she, he found her information okay. and he was able to call her. And he, had, he said to her, your husband's in a serious accident and I need you to get to the Fort Wayne Trauma Center. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay, um, I'll do that. And then they hung up. This is my wife's account because I don't remember this conversation. But mm -hmm. she said she went in to wake up her parents, my in-laws, who, mm -hmm. again, were staying with us that weekend. Mm -hmm. She said, hey, Scott's been in a serious accident. I need to get to the hospital. I had the only working vehicle at the time because our truck was in the oh, shop getting repaired. Oh, I see. And so praise the Lord. She they, was able to take their, their, their vehicle. vehicle. So my, my mm -hmm. actually, my dad woke up, my father-in-law, and he mm -hmm. said, okay, I'll take you to the hospital. My mother-in-law said, I'll watch the kids. <laughs> oh. And it worked out perfectly. So my wife and my father-in-law jumped in the vehicle and started driving. The, the problem is, is she couldn't remember what hospital they were taking me to. She was so shocked being woken up, uh -huh. you know, in the night. And hearing this news, she just didn't recall the name of the hospital. The name of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so she said to my, my father-in-law, she's like, I don't know where to go. And my father-in-law said, well, where was he going? She said, well, this is the church he was headed to, so let's just start driving that way. So they got on the toll road and just started driving blindly. Hmm. And then they, um, they got the idea to, to use Find My Phone oh. to see where my phone was located. Well, I was still on scene at the time. And my phone was still on the scene. Was still on the scene. And they were able to find the location of the accident and start driving towards the scene of the accident. Hmm. The whole time, she's calling my cell phone over and over again, hoping somebody will answer it. And no one was speaking. And nobody was picking up because mm -hmm. they were too busy trying to get me out of the van. So she said at some point, a flight nurse answered the phone call. And she said, she answered the phone and she said, listen, we're taking off. I can't talk. And my wife said, okay, but please tell me where you're taking my husband. I'm his wife. I need to know where you're taking him. And she said, Fort Wayne trauma. Trauma. And mm -hmm. my wife said, thank you. And then the nurse, flight nurse hung up and that was it. So my wife, for a two and a half hour drive to this trauma unit, she basically, all she knows is I've been in a horrible car accident mm -hmm. and that I'm being airlifted. It's all she knows. She didn't know what critical condition you were in. She didn't know. Mm -hmm. And... You know, she told me later, she said, your mind goes through the worst possible scenario. She said, I, I remember thinking, you know, we've never talked about whether you want to be cremated or mm -hmm. buried. We've mm -hmm. never talked about what your funeral is going to be like or where you want to be buried. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, my mind automatically was just was, going was to this worst, worst case, case scenario. scenario. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because in that moment, you're in shock. You're trying to think what's happening and what could happen. And yeah. Yeah, you you you're just they hanging on God like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm I'm thinking the worst case scenario, but this is the desire I want to see my husband again. Yeah, so you get to the hospital, and did she did she get there whilst you that the time that you arrived, or she got there later? So she. Believe it or not, they arrived at the hospital almost identically around the time that I did, which was around eight o'clock in the morning, mm. which is hard for us to believe in terms of the timeline uh, because the accident happened at about 545. So it took, it was two hours before I received any um, trauma treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only thing that was being happening was I was being given blood transfusions, um, but it, it was a two hour time period from the time of the accident uh, until I was actually able to be admitted into a trauma unit and have some of the surgeries and procedures done mm -hmm. that I needed to have done to save my life. Um, so it's the providence of God that 
I'm leaking blood everywhere and I'm yeah, still and somehow sustained. And you're sustained. And yeah. you're still conscious too. And I was, I was, yeah. So I actually regained consciousness being taken out of the helicopter. I remember that, mm -hmm. that cold air hit me. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up and I was once again begging them for pain medication. <laughs> I said, please, please knock me out. This is, this is really, really bad. Um, and I don't, rem I don't remember really much after that. Um, I remember being wheeled in. I remember the state trooper had arrived at the hospital uh -huh. and was walking next to me down the hall as they were wheeling me as they were wheeling into you. the trauma unit. Mm -hmm. And that is really all I remember until probably almost three days later. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that was my last memory for a few days. So my wife and father-in-law did arrive uh -huh. right around the same time. A chaplain met them, which okay. was kind of a red flag for them too. Mm. The chaplain said, hey, um, they're willing them into surgery here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first time that actually she had found out that I was still alive. Oh. Um, but she knew it was serious. Mm -hmm. And they told her that it's serious. Um, you know, he's got some pretty extensive Bad injuries. And these, yeah. these risk surgeries are risky. Mm -hmm. So just kind of be prepared for, you know, the best and worst. So the three days that uh, you didn't know what has happening from the stories that you have heard, what was exactly happening in those three days? From what my wife has told me, her timeline is that um, that day, that Sabbath, I was in surgery most of the day. Mm. And then later in the day, um, I came out of surgery, was in post-op for a while. Then uh, by the evening, they were able to admit me into a critical care room. Mm -hmm. And so I was in that critical care room. The next day I had another surgery apparently mm. and was also put back into post-op and then back into my critical care room. And then the third day I had another surgery. So I had a total of five surgeries, five surgeries back over the back. course of those three days. Mm. And um, after that final surgery, I was put back in the critical care room. And I think it was later that day I woke up mm -hmm. and start having, I started having memories of what was happening. So people had arrived. My brother had arrived. He had flown in. Mm -hmm. um, we have a friend who's like a mother to me, who mm -hmm. is uh, a nurse. Her husband's a physician and she, f she came in so that she could help with, you know, medical advocacy mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing. Um, so we had some people coming and arriving immediately to help with some of the immediate needs immediate that we had. Needs. Yeah. yeah, I just want to highlight that for, for a moment because I remember your wife took over your Facebook page and mm. she was updating us, which was really helpful because we were praying for you mm. and probably you know this better than me, but there were a lot of churches that mm. had uh, posted and shared that uh, that news. Yeah. So uh, if you can uh, just highlight a little bit of the love and care that you received from a lot of different places during that time. Yeah, it wasn't until really after that third day, maybe even the fourth day that my wife, I remember her, we had one quiet moment when nurses weren't coming in another room. I think mm -hmm. they were trying to stabilize my blood pressure and, and my hemoglobin levels. So it was really crazy those first several days. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had a moment when my brother had gone out to get a meal and, um, you know, the other, the other people that were there visiting um, had just stepped out of the room to, to handle some things. And so it was just Heather and I for the first time. Mm -hmm. And she kind of got in my bed with me. And she just... I remember her looking at me and she just took my face in her hands. She said, baby, she says, you have no mm -hmm. idea how many people are praying for you. She, <laughs> I remember that. She just yeah. looked me straight in the eyes. She's like, yeah. you don't have... Mm -hmm. any idea she says my phone your facebook page our email it's our text messages yeah. are blowing up mm -hmm. she said literally she said thousands of people all over the world people we don't even know mm -hmm. are praying you through this amen i wish you could amen. see it amen. she's just gonna have to believe me someday mm -hmm. you'll get to go back and look at all this and look at all the messages and yeah. realize that god is reaching down to us, Amen. to the hands and the feet of all these people. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it was powerful. Amen. I'll never Amen. forget that moment. It was Amen. one of the first lucid moments I remember having, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was the time that you just got your consciousness back and you could 
yeah, and, it, and I had what was I, yeah any memories of what was happening. I think they said I was conscious on and off those first few days, but mm-hmm. I was so heavily medicated that I remember none of it. <laughs> so, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So, did your kids understood what was happening, or they the- were told? So, when um, when I was in surgery the first day on Sabbath, my wife called. Mm-hmm home and told the girls what happened when they were awake. They said, listen, you know, daddy has been in a car accident. And they asked, well, was he hurt? And she said, yeah, his legs are not quite working right, but the doctors are doing their best to fix them. Mm. Um, But we think daddy's going to be just fine. But you guys, if you want to do something for daddy, you can pray for him today. Mm -hmm. And so they just, you know, they were, I don't know, five and seven at the time. Yeah, yeah. And they said, okay, we can pray for daddy. Mm. And that's what they did. Um, they Amen. prayed for daddy. And the Amen. kids have faith. You know, they, at that moment, I don't think they were really comprehending the seriousness, the, the, the of, the situation. seriousness of the situation. They just yeah. know daddy left to go to a concert and he's not back yet. <laughs> yeah. He's not feeling good. He's in yeah. the hospital and right. we're praying for him. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, take us through that time you were in the hospital. I think you had more surgeries after mm-hmm. that. And how was that like? You know, I was in critical care for a little over a week, Mm -hmm. and that was mainly just because these surgeries were attempting to, you know, repair the bone damage. You know, I had rods that were had to be placed. Mm -hmm. Um, I had soft tissue uh, wounds um, that were pretty serious Mm -hmm. that they weren't sure they'd be able to close. So I would be going back in for them to clean these wounds out so they wouldn't get infected, and then they Mm -hmm. would close the wound further. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they'd wait a day for me to recover from to that recover surgery, from and that. I'd go back in, and you know they called them INDs, where they just cleaned things out and tried to stretch the skin tighter to close the wound. Mm-hmm. They were trying to avoid a skin graft, is what they were trying to avoid. So I remember just kind of being in and out of surgery. Um, I remember there was another team that was focused on my um, my blood situation because my hemoglobin levels were not recovering. Mm. And so I think day five, um, I remember a team came in after I had had blood work. They had done a blood draw. They did it twice a day. And then all of a sudden, my lab results came in and, and, the, and this entire team uh, of physicians and, and nurse practitioners just showed up. Mm. And they, they said, we have to get you into imaging right now. Mm. And I said, why? I feel okay. And they're like, you're not okay. You're, we think you're bleeding internally. We can't get your blood levels oh, right. really? And so they started doing all these. They had already done a set of chest X-rays and full body scans, but they did another set of scans. Mm -hmm. They said, you must have some upper body trauma that we've missed. You know, this accident was so serious. You probably have blunt force trauma somewhere and you're bleeding internally because your Mm -hmm. blood levels are not, you know, we've given you six units of blood and you're still not recovering. And so they did all these scans. They could not find any internal bleeding. And it finally just came down to they just thought my, my wounds were still bleeding, my bones were still leaking oh, out, and the bone marrow that recovers your blood was yeah, damaged to right, the point where right. it was not recovering. It was not recovering. So yeah. they just kept giving me blood transfusion after blood transfusion. I remember uh, that um, over and over again until the mm-hmm. hemoglobin levels finally stabilized, which is what kept me in critical care for that week. For, for that week, mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, all these surgeries, um, your, your, your body is under all this um, a strain, mm. how, how did that feel to you? I, I was so heavily medicated. I think that I don't remember feeling an incredible amount of pain really okay. ever. But I do remember... I remember the seriousness, the, the, I think the solemnity, the, you know, how bad this was, it was starting, it was starting to sink in, Mm -hmm. you know, at first you're just in a bed laying there and people are pulling you and tugging you and you're not quite emotionally or mentally all there yet Mm because you've been in and out of surgery, you're waking up from anesthesia, back under anesthesia, waking up. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when I realized how seriously I had been injured. Mm. And there was a conflicting emotion. There was an emotion that was so grateful that I was alive. Because as the state trooper was recounting to me what had happened, as I was looking at photographs of the van, the, the, like, the, one, yeah. of the, one of the actual EMT nurses was taking pictures of the scene 
for me to have later. For she and she texted it. us those pictures. Wow. So we got to see the scene of the accident. And so there was a part of my heart that was so grateful, just saying, God, thank you for sparing my life. Mm -hmm. Thank you that I'm here breathing and living and still a dad and still a husband, right. still a servant. Mm -hmm. And that was conflicting with the part of me that went, you know, from here on down, things what is are gonna not happen? okay. Yeah. Yeah. How what am gonna I going to leave? Yeah. And there was discussion about the pulse. I wasn't having, a, it wasn't a pulse in my left foot mm -hmm. because of the damage done to my arteries and veins and discussion about me being paralyzed in that foot. There was a discussion about the possibility of amputation below the knee. Um, there was a lot of things being talked about mm. during that first week. And that can weigh heavy on your on your mind it was yeah. it was i was in an i was it was it was an acute time right of uncertainty i i think around that time you posted a post on facebook i think i think that was around the time that you started posting i remember being excited to act you said uh on your page this is actually scott yes. i was like amen praise <laughs> the lord because all this time we were getting updates from your wife yes and the time that you started posting i was so happy to see a post that was coming from you. Yeah. And I think some of those posts, that's when you were explaining how heavy the situation was, I think. Yeah. I, there was, it, was a, it was a blessing to be able to share. I think for a lot of people have ser shared the same sentiment that you've shared, where mm -hmm. once they started seeing that I was posting, they thought, okay, he's going to be okay. Like yeah. this is, yeah. the worst yeah. is over most yeah. likely. Yeah. And, yeah. and somebody we love dearly is going to be okay. Um, you know, behind the scenes, I was struggling again with how serious the injuries were, mm -hmm. how serious the prognosis was Yeah, because there was nobody telling me you're going to be okay, mm -hmm. but they were hoping for the best, right, but expecting right, the worst, right. you know? So, and they don't want to give you false hope. They tell you what it is, yes. like how it is, yeah. Yeah. which is what you want. You want your medical mm -hmm. professionals to be frank. Right, right, right. But I do remember one particular evening this was probably a week into this. Mm -hmm. And it was just Heather and I in the room. It was probably nine o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I was um, really struggling with the fact that I wasn't sure I was going to walk again. Mm. And I have never in my life, not once experienced depression. Like people talk about experiencing depression, just never have, just not one of those people. You know, you have days when you're, uh, bummed out a little bit, but right. this was what, what started happening to me that evening was probably the closest thing that I could ever imagine depression being like where mm -hmm. emotionally and mentally I reached a place where I was giving up. Mm. I was saying, Lord, I don't think I I'm was ever going to be the I was about to ask you that, that how was your faith at that point? Yeah. That was the lowest time. Mm-hmm. I've never felt like that in my entire existence, mm -hmm. the way I felt that night. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, God, I don't know that I want to live. And I remember telling Heather, she was laying in bed with me that night again, like she always did. Mm -hmm. She was laying right, right next to me before she went to the hotel room she was staying at. I remember telling her, you know, God could have let me go in the van. Mm -hmm. He could have let me go. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the point is of saving me if I'm never going to walk again mm -hmm. and I'm going to be in pain again mm -hmm. and I'm going to struggle and feel the way that I'm feeling. This doesn't make a lot of sense why he didn't just let me go. Mm -hmm. And that concerned her pretty heavily. And she actually got a nurse and one of the nurses came in and she was talking to me and she got really concerned. And then they called in someone who they called in a physician who came in and talked to me. And then they said, we're going to, prescribe you some medicine tonight mm -hmm. <laughs> that are gonna, that's going to help you. And it turned out to be something that uh, they actually prescribed for depression. Oh, and so okay. I started receiving a medicine and that was the one and only time in my life for 24 mm -hmm. hours I received depression medicine. De depression medicine, yeah. And uh, they called on a team the next day, a, a rehabilitation team mm -hmm. that said, we need to, we're going to get you out of your room. We want you to look outside and get some sunlight. We need to get you in a wheelchair. We got to mm -hmm. get you up. Mm -hmm. um, they had heard about what had happened last the night before. Right, so it was right, pretty bad. It was right. a low place. Mm -hmm. And I came out of it within 24 hours. It was, I was, and I've Praise never the been Lord. there since and I Praise never will Lord. be. Amen. But Amen. Um, God had to, it was not human effort that pulled me through that. Mm. 
So on the spiritual side, uh, um, oh, do you remember what thoughts made you come out of that experience? Like, I don't think or, it was anything internal. I think okay. it was my wife getting on her knees and praying and through praying, it that night. And praying. And yeah. she reached out to a select few of our closest friends in our inner circle and said, Scott is in a really dark place tonight that I've never seen him at mm -hmm. and we need prayer. Mm -hmm. And those people stopped what they were doing and they began to pray. And they began to pray. Yeah. I think it's one of those times, I'm like the man who was let down through the roof on his bed, he could not do Amen. anything for himself. Amen. Amen. He relied on the faith of his friends. And that was one of those few times that my normally independent self was 100% relying on the faith of the people around mm. me. There was nothing I could do to come out of that. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's, it's, it's good to have uh, an army of prayer warriors. Absolutely yeah, yeah. necessary in our faith journey. Yeah, because as, as you're recollecting now, there's nothing you could have done yourself. No. Yeah, but other people had to lift you up and they knew specifically what to pray for. Yes. And it's something that you can share with the whole world on, uh, on Facebook or anything. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some things just don't, are not appropriate in a setting like that. Yeah. So you reach out to the people who you know um, are your prayer warriors. Yeah, that's right. So how long did you, did you stay in that unit um, that you were in? So I was in a, uh, I was in a critical care unit mm -hmm. for, um, I think, almost eight days, eight or nine days. And then... Um, once they stabilized all my vitals, I was able to transfer to a step down acute care unit. Mm -hmm. And then I was there for another eight or nine days um, before finally being released to go home. And uh, that was a blessing. The acute care unit was, um, I just got more sleep. There weren't, you know, people were not checking on you every hour of the night. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, had that's had a little more privacy oh, and was just um, able to focus a little more on, you know, recovery, recovery from the acute stage of my injuries. Right, right. Um, so it was there that they taught me how to transfer from bed into a wheelchair. Oh. It was there that they taught me how to transfer from a wheelchair into a car. They said, you, you, unless you can learn to do these wheelchair transfers, we cannot release you to go home. Mm. And so I was incentivized. Um, I said to them, how long in a situation like mine would I typically be here? And they said about a month. And I said, I don't want to be her a month. <laughs> they said, well, then this is what you have to do. And they gave me they a checklist. Yeah. Um, they knew how acute my injuries were. So they said, just expect to be here three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I engaged myself as much as I possibly could because I wanted to get out of there. You I, I was to done being in a there. hospital. Right, right. And so I worked hard at it. I worked hard every day. I spent um, two four-hour stints in PT and mm -hmm. OT, uh, occupational therapy and rehabilitation therapy. And they worked simultaneously with me. I had a team that worked on trying to get me some range of motion in my legs just to be able to move them at all because I couldn't move them in bed at all. So oh. if my leg was uncomfortable, mm -hmm. somebody would have to call a nurse and they'd have to come and move my leg. Can't move your legs, yeah. And so we were trying to get to the point where I had some minimal movement and mm -hmm. control over my legs and could transfer. I had to have some of that control to be able to transfer and so that's what I did every single day. I learned how to transfer in and out of a wheelchair. I learned how to transfer in and out of a car. They had an, an actual car inside this rehabilitation unit. Oh, really? In a room. So they have this room so like for, this. So for training. Yeah, and there's a yeah. car in there, and there's a bed in there, and a kitchen, and a washer, and a dryer. And they, oh, so they, they taught me how to pull up to a kitchen counter and make a sandwich and oh, reach wow. for utensils and get in and out of the car and get in and out of the bed. Wow. Um, how to do laundry. So that's part of the... Yeah training <laughs> right 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 and i remember during that time you posting how nice your 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 pt team that they was were amazing. working with you so they were, they're rock stars they're amazing i just, they yeah, just want to stop and highlight that if you can share how the staff at the hospital how they were encouraging and that's the staff is yeah. everything you know from the nurses that i worked with um that worked with me in the, the in the in the icu in the critical care unit uh -huh. they were amazing i've prayed with several of them mm -hmm. they prayed with me we had amazing conversations. I had a nurse that stayed in our room for almost an hour because she it was a night shift and she didn't have any patient load. Oh, she stayed past precious. her shift just to talk to us. Praise the Lord. Um, 
the lady who came and cleaned the room, I could tell she was a Christian just by her demeanor. demeanor and I said yeah. to her, can I, <laughs> can I pray with you? And she said, of course. And we prayed together. Um, the, the PT and OT team were phenomenal. And when uh-huh. I say that these are people who have dedicated their lives Amen. to helping people when they're in the worst place yeah. of their life. Yeah. And yeah. that's where I was. I've never been worse. Mm-hmm. And these people were there teaching me how to bathe myself, how to do my own hair, how to put my own socks on, Mm. you know, how to get dressed, Mm -hmm. how to be as independent as possible while being in this wheelchair. They were the people who, when I was in pain to the point I wanted to pass out, who said, Mm -hmm. you have one more in you, do one more repetition. Um, And they were the people who made me laugh when I really was, you know, (laughs) depressed about how I couldn't do anything. You know, I'd say, I can't do anything. They'd say, well, you can do this. And they'd make you laugh. Um, Absolutely. It's a calling to be a PTOT, to be a nurse. Yes. yes, And, you know, people who have accepted that calling, my hat's off to you. You're you're heroes in my mind. And they're not always... uh, working with people that are religious or that are Christian like you. Right. They're probably working with people that are cussing. And Oh, yes. yeah. We had that. In my, <laughs> in my floor, we had people that were using choice words because they were going through the same challenge as I was, you know, yeah. and trying to learn yeah. to do things that you take for granted. Mm-hmm. You know, you just take for granted that you can walk up to a kitchen counter and make a sandwich. Right. I had to learn to wheel up to a kitchen counter, not mm. slam my knees against the cupboards because that's what I was doing because mm-hmm. I didn't know how to do this. Yeah. And so people were going through those challenges on that unit and you could see the different levels of frustration. Right. Um, right, right, right. Thankfully as a Christian, it just holds you to a higher standard and how you behave and how you yes. look at life and yes. how you look at your recovery. Yes. And I appreciate that. And how you interact with those who are helping yes. you. Yes. Yeah. You see them as, as uh, people that uh, have, uh, they, they have your best interests yes. in their minds. They're yeah. your allies. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're on your team. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think I don't know if it was before or after, but I don't want to skip this moment that I saw you posting about your your kids finally came to visit you, yeah. and there was a birthday. I don't know who it was. I don't remember who it was. Yeah, and I remember just tearing up just seeing that uh, that moment. You, it you was powerful. Share? Yeah, that was powerful. So my wife, her birthday is January twenty seven, mm-hmm. and my youngest daughter Aubrey, her birthday is January twenty eight. Mm-hmm. So they share birthdays back to back. Of course, I was in the hospital right during their birthdays. Their birthdays, And yeah. so they didn't get a celebration that you would normally consider a celebration. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my five-year-old is turning six. My wife is turning 18. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you have this scenario where I felt like all the attention was on me because I was the one in the hospital bed. Right. But my poor wife and my poor daughter, you know, they, they didn't get their special days. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, it was powerful because that particular day, the people who were watching our kids, um, decided to bring them to the hospital so that we could at least kind of celebrate it and make right. it special for them. Mm-hmm. And so we did, I mean, they brought some decorations, they brought some balloons and my wife oh, that was bought beautiful. a gift on Amazon <laughs> and had it shipped. <laughs> And we were able to celebrate my wife and my daughter, you know, that day for five hours, you know, while they were at the hospital. Oh, that's precious. And, you know, I want to highlight them because that really was their day. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the the blessing for me was that I was able to see my kids again. It had yes. been so long. Mm-hmm. And when they walked through that door, I remember telling myself, you're not going to cry. Your dad, <laughs> you're not going to cry. You're going to be strong for your kids. They're yeah. going to come and see you in... In a hospital bed with your legs wrapped up and, and you need to just be dad. Okay, yeah, that's who you, you are. Be, to be strong for yeah, them. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to be a mess today. Yeah, you're going to be dad. Yeah, yeah. And there was nothing I could do when they walked through that door. My kids walked through my door and I picked them up and I held them. There's nothing that can stop you from being mm-hmm. emotional. There's just nothing. Those yeah. are your babies. and mm-hmm. You're seeing them again. I'm seeing them again and yeah. I'm holding them and I'm hugging them. And I couldn't walk, but I could hug my kids. Could hug they got them. in that hospital bed and they sat on my lap and I could hug them. Oh. Yeah, it was powerful. And they were happy. I think you shared a video. They were happy playing as kids. They were kids. <laughs> yeah. Kids are so resilient. Mm-hmm. So resilient. I mean, their life was dramatically altered for several weeks. Right. Um, altered pretty heavily for several months and they were just awesome. Even, yeah, even when I came home, around. they were uh-huh. 
Daddy, do you need anything? Daddy, do you want a drink? Daddy, can I? And I, not not just for the first week, but we're literally the entire time. The I was in the, I was in a wheelchair for three months, and those kids mm-hmm. waited on me hand and foot that entire time. Anything they could do to relieve Daddy's burden, to relieve Mommy's burden. Oh, yeah. that's precious. They're a gift. Yeah, thank you for that segue. So, going out and going back home, how did that feel? Going home was so special. Mm-hmm. Um, Another deeply emotional time. Um, part of what created, what made it a dramatic event going home more mm-hmm. than it would have normally have been is our house was under renovations. And I was in the middle of doing major, major overhauls on the interior of the house. I mean, mm-hmm. moving walls and knocking down walls and uh, changing the sizes of bathrooms and putting vanities and toilets in. It was a major renovation there was no flooring in the house there was really no furniture in the house Mm -hmm. and we were had been living in our tour bus while i was doing these renovations in the house so it really wasn't by any stretch of the imagination ready for anybody to live in i mean Mm -hmm. there was no kitchen there was no stove like i said there were no toilets no sinks no showers no no anything Mm -hmm. um there were some friends that we had uh in pennsylvania that we have who we've grown close to Mm -hmm. And the uh, gentleman is very familiar with contracting. He's been a contractor many years of his life. He's now retired. They're the ones who came out to Michigan to watch the kids the entire time I was in the hospital. Praise the Lord. While I was in the hospital, the husband began calling Heather and saying, Hey, I noticed your house is under renovations. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do for you guys while we're here? And she said, you know, Scott can't come home and live in a bus. He can't be in a wheelchair. He cannot climb the stairs into the coach. Mm-hmm. It's going to be an impossible situation. So we're either going to have to move into a, some sort of handicap accessible little apartment or we're going to have to do something in this house. Mm-hmm. So she asked, she says, if you would be willing to put in a toilet and a shower and a sink so we have a bathroom, that's what we need. Mm-hmm. We can cook on a camp stove. We can get by. Mm-hmm. He can wheel around on these plywood floors. But if we just have those basic things... Um, we can put a bed in there. We can make it, you know, comfortable. Believable, we had yeah. a few things of furniture in there because we had camped out in the house already several nights because the kids wanted to sleep in there. So mm-hmm. there were a couple pieces of furniture, but um, it wasn't ready for prime time. And so that man began to work. And the more he worked, the more he wanted to do. And the more he wanted to do, the more he realized he needed a team. So he had actually called several oh, was, church members. I was going to ask if he worked, he worked he, by himself. He did yeah. for a while. And then he decided, I'm going to get some help and we're going to we're going to get this house ready. Did he have a timeline? Did he have, have an idea of when you were going he to come? He knew that I'd be coming home in a matter of weeks. He didn't know how few. Okay. I think he was expecting three to four weeks. Mm-hmm. I don't think he realized it would be less than three. So he called some people that he knew in Pennsylvania that were church members and said, Hey, we've got a project. Would you guys be willing to come? And Mm -hmm. so they started showing up with tool trucks and with equipment and all of the things that were needed to do this home renovation. And he started asking people from our local church here in Stevensville, the pastor, pastor Bryce Bowman, he showed up and he came with his son and they began to work in the house and a couple of other church members. I remember Mm -hmm. Rudy, Marshner and Tracy Bliven showed up and they began to work in our house, putting in a handicap accessible ramp. And yeah, I saw he that. had a team of nine people at one point working mm-hmm. in this house every day, every day doing a complete and total renovation. Wow. And I'm talking everything, all the toilets, all the showers, all the sinks, putting in new kitchen cabinets, putting in a stove, putting in trim, mm-hmm. painting the trim, putting in furniture, putting in curtains and and uh bedding new bedding and 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 new couch covers and i mean i can't it was a you know bunk beds carpet you know all the flooring got put Mm. in the house it was how are they funding this project at this time like they just knew it needed to be done uh and they would call heather and say check your phone for pictures is this color the right color you want for carpet is this color flooring a good color flooring for you? Wow. Um, just asking. And she's going, what are you guys doing? And they're like, don't worry about what we're doing. Just approve or deny <laughs> or reject these <laughs> because, color choices. Yeah, because we don't want to put our own color. <laughs> that was literally, yeah, that was really what was happening. Um, they were literally doing an extreme home makeover wow. 
while we were in the hospital, while we were focusing on pulling together as a family, mm-hmm. these people were showing us love the Lord. in the best possible way they could. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So you get back to your house that was completely different. It was surreal. I rolled up that ramp, which I was so grateful for. Yeah. Because I used that ramp for three months. Mm-hmm. And they opened the door of the house and I go in and I knew they had been doing something. I had never, ever in a million years I would have imagined So were you that seeing the this. pictures as well? I just saw, I never. nobody ever if sent you, me pictures, okay. but I knew <clears> that they had put flooring and carpet in because I had seen that there were samples okay. of flooring and carpet being mm-hmm. sent to Heather. So I never saw any pictures of the interior of the house. No one ever sent pictures of the interior of the house. So we just had no idea what they were doing. Mm. So I expected to see maybe some floors put in that I could roll this wheelchair on. But when we rolled through that, kitchen door into the house and I looked around I wow. didn't recognize the home mm. I knew it was our house but I didn't recognize it and it was a very weird disconnected feeling wow I was we were we were we immediately you were mind blown we yeah. were we were we just immediately both just started sobbing <laughs> I can imagine our friends just came and began to hug us they have oh. it on video <laughs> <laughs> we just sobbed you can't respond any other way. Yeah. You just can't. The, That's it. the overwhelming emotion of knowing that people have loved on you in a such a profound deep, way. Deep amount of love. Yeah. It's deep. Yeah. yeah. It is deep. So you got back home and you started adjusting mm-hmm. and you still have um, like visits to the doctor yeah. and um, things to work on. But at this time, are you encouraged that uh, you've made so much progress and you're seeing the hand of God. Yeah. God has provided above and beyond emotional support, spiritual support, yeah. and even physical needs yeah. at this time. So how are you looking at the progress that you had made and the future at that moment? It was about a month before I was engaged in any rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. So my rehab team at the acute care facility had said, you're... Leg injuries are so acute that every time we try to work with your legs, your wounds open back up Uh, and begin to to bleed. Mm -hmm. So they recommended that we wait on physical therapy and rehabilitation until until the wounds closed enough Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't be compromised with manipulation. Mm -hmm. So that took about a month. I was seeing a wound care specialist every single week Mm -hmm. who was applying special um, dressings to these wounds. Mm -hmm. My wife was doing wound dressing changes every single day using some of the dressings that they gave her. She was my, she was my home health care nurse. nurse. She was amazing. Uh Um, So that was kind of the first month and we really had no idea what my recovery was going to be. At that time, I still wasn't really using my legs at all or moving them at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was starting to feel out what life would be like to be a paraplegic, because that's what I was assuming could happen. I mean, mm, mm-hmm. I, I knew that I would probably gain some sensation and feeling back, but I didn't at that time. Mm. But about a month into it, I began going to uh, see a physical therapy team um, near here, and they did an ass- assessment on me. The director of the program actually took me on as his personal case. Oh, really? And I began working with them. And he was the first person, he and his uh, team member, Lori Bliven, who's also a church member. Oh. They were the first people who told me, you will walk again. You will probably run again. And you're going to live a very, very, very successful, Praise, wonderful life, Lord. fully rehabilitated. So were they saying that uh, from the standpoint of faith or they were seeing your progress? I think it was a combination of faith um, seeing my attitude, because I did come in with an attitude of let's do this. Right. And uh, their medical expertise, seeing injuries like this and knowing what the what the possibilities were. Mm. And so I think there was an aspect of all three of those things coming together oh. with that prognosis. Praise the Lord. So did that encourage you to hear it those did. words? It did. I mean, I had two medical <laughs> professionals telling me, you're going to be okay. Amen. It's going to take a long time. They said, you're going to be in physical therapy for a year or more, mm-hmm. and it will take time. And you'll probably have a two to three year recovery period of regaining your maximum medical improvement, but you will get better. Amen. And that was Amen. very, very encouraging to me. I knew yeah, right then and there that. That is very encouraging. Yeah. So, so, so what did the events look like after that? Um, so from then on, it was an aggressive uh, physical therapy program. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I was in physical therapy several times a week, three or four times a week, mm -hmm. going in for an hour to two hours a day. Mm -hmm. And it was aggressive. I mean, we would work really hard at building the strength in my legs. There's all kinds of exercises they were able to do with my legs that were manipulative exercises mm -hmm. to regain the strength, to stretch the muscles out. Everything had atrophied. My legs were very, 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 very skinny. I mean, oh, it was really? just bones and skin. Everything had atrophied because it mm. doesn't take long for your muscle. Yeah, muscle, when you're not using them. Yeah, yeah, your muscle mass, muscle tone goes completely away. Mm. So um, they worked um, on a non-load bearing, non-weight bearing basis for almost probably a month and a half, maybe almost two months uh, with me, building the strength in those legs using machines. Mm -hmm. And then over time, um, as the wounds healed, I began to go to the pool and swim and use you know, water hydrotherapy to, to try to build the, the muscle tone the, in my legs. In Even though legs. I couldn't stand and hold my own weight, I could get in the water. Hmm. So I could wheelchair up to the water and get in the water from my wheelchair and swim. And I felt amazing in the pool because I was oh, weightless. Oh, I see. Um, I was wondering how yeah, you, you did that. It okay. was amazing. Um, so over time, I, they began building the strength in the legs. And I remember the day came when it was time for me to stand. Mm -hmm. And the very first time I stood actually without assistance, I was at home. I was by myself. And I remember thinking, my legs feel really good today. I think I can stand. And my wife was a little concerned about it. She's like, I don't know if this is a good idea, but she kind of stood by me uh -huh. to catch me. I wore a gait belt, which is a belt that can, you can right, grab. Right. Uh -huh. And I remember pushing off of my dresser and my countertop, my desktop, and I was able to very slowly, very painfully stand up. Stand up. And I just stood up for just a few seconds and I went back down in the wheelchair. But right, right, right then and there, I knew I'm going to be okay. It was possible. This is yeah. it. This is, this, is, this is what I'm shooting for. Oh, I'm going to get praise better. praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that, that, that would be a huge encouragement. It was. Although it wasn't that long, but it was long enough to just give you that courage to say, hey, this yeah. is doable. It's going to be okay. Yeah, because the, the biggest challenge is in your mind and your heart. It's really not your body. Your body at some level will follow your mind and your heart. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because I was actually wondering, I've heard so many people, even people who will be helping like nurses and medical practitioners saying, hey, uh, be strong. And so I always wondered how that actually contributes to, uh, to your body actually mm. being strong, fighting something, um, your, your, your mental, where, where you are mentally and that spirit of we're going to do this. Yeah. How it actually imp impacts the body in responding. It does. To it. it does. It's, we, it, we hear it talked about all the time. Yeah. Athletes discuss it all the time. Uh, but the truth is there, there is a remarkable amount of control we have over our physical recovery, mm -hmm. over our, you know, physical state that it really starts in the mind, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we're, we're reminded where your heart is or your treasure will be. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what you put into your mind is what's going to come out. And that's true. Um, there have been so many scientific studies that have proven the point that you can will yourself to be ill and you can will yourself to be right. well. Right. And once I had enough physical evidence that I could be better, I willed myself to be well. Praise and it Lord. doesn't come um, in place of faith. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come in place of reality, but it comes from a place of, I intend to be 100% better. I intend someday to glorify God by telling people I've made mm -hmm. a 100% recovery from a catastrophic accident. This is my intention. Yeah. So I'm going to get as close to that as I possibly can. And I won't stop reaching for that until I know reasonably mm -hmm. that I cannot get any further. And I think that is, that is the place that every Christian should have. And that's, that's, that's where we should all be in our hearts mm -hmm. because it is, it's, the, it's the humanity united with the divinity. God that's could have right. rolled the stone away. He could yeah. have said, stone, roll away, and then Lazarus come forth, right? But he mm -hmm. says, hey, you, you roll the stone you away. Roll the stone you away. can do that, but I'll do what you can't do. I'll, I'll bring life to this man. Yeah, or the man that was told to go and wash his eyes in the... <laughs> in the in the in the river, when when he had put uh, that mud on, the his, mud on his eyes, yeah. on his eyes, yeah, yeah. Hey, thank you for highlighting that because I always wondered like how how much of an impact it mm -hmm. makes 
when someone said, hey, stay, hang in there, hang mm. in there, uh, keep fighting. Yeah, like people who be fighting cancer and someone said, hey, uh, keep fighting, don't give up. Right. How, how that actually impacts It the makes all the difference. It mm-hmm. makes all the difference. And I think, you know, if you have a friend or a family member, a loved one who's going through an acute, physically debilitating period of their life, mm-hmm. that encouragement will go a long way. And again, encouragement from a place of love, a place yes. of understanding, not a place of, of indifference, right. but from a place of love and understanding saying, I know this is the hardest thing you've ever gone through. Mm-hmm. I know that you hurt. I know that the future is cloudy, but I also know you have more in you mm. and you can do more. You can do better. You can be more well than you are now. Amen. And Amen. I will walk this road Amen. with you hand Amen. in hand if you're willing to try your best to get better. And people have told me that. And I'm where I am today because of people like that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that because that helps me understand how how that connection actually helps the people encouraging right. and your mindset mm. um, saying, I'm going to do this. So you stood up for a few seconds and you, you sit down again in the wheelchair mm. and you have that courage. Yeah. So how did the journey proceed? In you, in, in you getting better and better? Pretty much from then on out, I knew um, I wasn't going to stop until mm-hmm. I was better. Mm-hmm. And so I have pushed and I have pushed and I've continued to push um, to reach that what they call that maximum medical improvement when you are as good as you're going to be mm-hmm. for the rest of your life. And uh, from here on out, you just maintain as far as you've gotten. Mm-hmm. And so I'm the closest that I've ever been. Obviously, I'm walking. You know, I transitioned from the wheelchair to a walker. I rolled around with, an, with a walker with tennis How balls on the feel? bottom. <laughs> you know, I felt amazing. I mean, I know I looked like a 90-year-old man, but I felt yeah. amazing to just be able to use a walker. And at first, it was using a walker to go from the bed to the bathroom. And it was, you know, a 10-foot oh. distance. And that was enough. And I go... Mm-hmm back to the bed and I would just breathe really heavy for the longest time and my legs right. would hurt the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. And then it was, you know, from bed into the living room. And then um, I would sit down on my chair and I would, my legs would hurt for the rest of the day and I'd be done. You know, mm-hmm. I'd take a nap. I mean, half the time, if I walked from it with the walker from the bedroom to the living room, I would take a nap. I'd take an hour long nap from that. Mm. Um, and then it got further and further and further. And, um, there was a point in time when I got one of those rolling walkers that had the little hand brakes and had mm-hmm. wheels. And I was able to take that outside and take some walks oh, in the lawn in outside the lawn. with that. And it had a seat so I could just sit. You know, I'd walk across the lawn, and maybe 10 you, or 15 you, feet, you and I'd sit and rest uh-huh. and I'd do more. So this was just this Gradually. painfully <laughs> slow progress. <laughs> and PT's working with you on strength and, yeah. and flexibility and range of motion. And you're going home and trying to push yourself at home as much as possible. And, mm-hmm. Um, I remember a couple months into this, they lifted my driving restriction. Yeah, I was under a driving restriction. They lifted oh, that. And so, and then you, a, you started driving. I started driving, yeah. you know, where I was able to drive, which was, you know, I had to, I had to overcome a, a very small amount of anxiety over driving yes, again, you know, yes, getting because back those memories van. come back. You yeah. do, you just have, you're you very know, cautious. It and, was difficult yeah. to get in a vehicle again for the first time. It took, mm-hmm. a, took a few moments. It took my breath away a little bit to get in that vehicle for the first time, but I thought you're going to have to drive the rest of your life. So you're going to, you're going to buck up and you're going to get through (laughs) this. And, uh, you know, with God's help you do. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was just, it's been constant progress since then every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, you know, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I I have some damage in my knees as a result of the accident. When you, when you break a femur, it's about 900 pounds of force to break a femur. And so that force that broke the femur also, you know, is very, very, it does severe damage to your damage joints, to your too. joints too. And yeah. so I have some um, torn ligaments and meniscus in my knee. Mm-hmm. And so that's just causing some mobility issues. And so they're going to work on fixing that surgically next month. And then okay. I have some uh, uh, more um, images going to be done on my left knee just to make sure everything's okay. Mm-hmm. But the light at the end of the tunnel is getting brighter every day. Praise the Lord. And, um, and then when yeah. I was nervous for you, I saw you biking <laughs> because I think you you posted yeah. something biking. Yeah. I was like, Scott, what are you doing? <laughs> I could ride a bike before I could walk, which was amazing. <laughs> There's just no impact. It's this rotational 
thing. And I found I accidentally one day I just thought, you know, I'm going to use my walker, hobble over to a bike, Mm -hmm. have Heather help me get on a bike and see if I can ride. And I got on the bike and it was amazing. It was like I never stopped riding. Right. So that was a powerful. I saw the joy that that you had. It was amazing. (laughs) Oh, this new mobility. I can ride a bike. I can't walk, but I can ride a bike. (laughs) Ride a bike. That was that was incredible. And then uh, recently I saw you at PMC singing. How did Mm -hmm. how did that feel like after a long break? Um, It was um, it was a blessing. You know, I when you're when you're called to do something and you can't do it Mm -hmm. for so long, Mm -hmm. there's an ache inside of you. There's an empty ache Mm -hmm. inside your heart. And that ache has been there. Um, I've always said that I want to recover fully so that when I'm back on a platform and I'm singing, I'm not limping and I'm not hobbling around. I don't want to garner the sympathy of people who are seeing me sing. Yeah. I just don't want that. Mm-hmm. Right now, I have nothing to complain about. I have mm-hmm. everything to be grateful for. So sympathy is the last thing I need. Um, I want to be on the platform again singing from a place of strength, from a place of Amen. recovery where Amen. people can say, wow, look at Scott, praise God yes. that he is fully made whole again. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm headed very rapidly. I'm headed that direction. So the you know our touring won't be happening actively until i'm done with all these surgeries and i can actually be back on the mm-hmm. road um full time i intend to do it i did sing for a funeral of a friend and that was powerful um, yes because it gave me an opportunity to be on a platform doing what god calls us to do in music ministry and that is to minister yes and i was ministering to his family that were left behind Mm. that were mourning his loss. It Mm -hmm. was unexpected. It was too early and their hearts were hurting. Mm. And yet a song could lift their hearts to heaven for just three or four minutes. Amen. And there I was Mm -hmm. even in my incapacity able to um, serve God Mm. and serve his people in that moment. And I'm grateful for that. It, it, It encouraged me that, God can still use me even in my imperfection and my physical incapacity. Oh, I was I was so happy. I was so happy to see you sing again. I was <laughs> it so felt happy. Good. Yeah. On on your feet, you didn't have any walker or any yeah. any any clutches and yeah. It was a blessing. Yeah, it was a it was a huge blessing. You know, although you didn't sing this song, but it reminded me, I think it was uh second time one of the earliest days that I met you. Um it was um at uh, Shalat, mm. when we were doing the canvassing program, you had come to 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 sing there, and I think that there was one friend who was going through some difficulties, or probably that was the story behind the song "Blessings." Mm. So I remember you sharing that story and singing that song, although yeah. you didn't sing that song there at the at the at the funeral. But it just reminded me of that song yeah. after this whole experience and just uh, putting the lyrics together with the experience. Back then, you were sharing another person's experience. Right. But now this song probably means a lot yeah. more to you. It's personal. Yeah. I think anything I sing from here on out yeah. is going to be our story. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife and I and our kids, it's going to be our story. This is not another story of someone that I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you my story. I have now had a face-to-face with death, Mm -hmm. had a face-to-face with God. I've had a face-to-face with my own salvation. You know, I remember the the one very lucid moment in the van I had while while waiting for that police officer to show up. Mm -hmm. I remember being on the phone with dispatch, and when I was starting to lose my vision, I thought maybe... I would lose consciousness and that maybe I would that die. That would be the, the, the end. And yeah. before I lost consciousness, I remember saying, God, mm-hmm. are we good? Mm. And I remember that's all I said. And God said to me, we're good. Mm. And I know everybody talks about that peace that floods over them. We talk about it as a peace that passes understanding. It does pass understanding because I'm sitting on the side of a toll road in the dark, Mm -hmm. alone, in the cold, Mm -hmm. dying, and I have peace coming over me. Just you and God. That doesn't make sense. Mm. It passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. But God was there saying, no matter what, we're good. And I knew I could die on the side of that road and everything would be okay. Mm. 
And I told the state trooper this. He said, when he told me how bad my injuries were, I said, listen, if I die, tell my wife I've talked to God and we're good. Wow. <laughs> and he said to me, "Wow, I really want you to tell your wife that. I said, listen, I don't know where you're at with God. Mm -hmm. I don't know where your heart is at with him. I said, but I'm telling you right now, God and I are good. Mm. And I want my wife to know that. She needs to know and have the assurance of my salvation if something happens to me. He said, okay, I'll tell her, but I'd really prefer you do it. You need to stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had those moments where I have faced these real things. And when I sing now, when I share this testimony, when I'm be. asked to recall mm -hmm. these stories, mm -hmm. it comes from a place of personal, of personal growth and personal growth. faith and personal experience for sure. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Any last words? I think I would leave anybody with this simple reminder that has been my mantra in my life now. And mm -hmm. that is whether you live or die, whether in sickness or in health, mm -hmm. whether you're rich or you're poor, you know, we make these vows to our spouses, but this is our vow to God. Mm -hmm. God is good. Amen. Regardless Amen. of what happens. He is good. If I had died on the side of the road that morning on January 21, mm. God would have still been good. Mm -hmm. I'm alive and God is good. If Amen. I never walked again, God is good. Amen. I'm walking again. Amen. God is good. So I want to leave anybody who's ever had their faith challenged that it doesn't matter what the outcome is. If you are in his hands, God is good. Amen. Amen. I, I, I don't have any comment after that. I cannot say it any, any better than that. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, I know when you're telling the story, it brings all those uh, memories and some of the emotions mm -hmm. as well. But I just, I'm so grateful that I get the opportunity to actually be the first person to sit you down and... <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was a blessing yeah, to share. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very, very positive, 100%, that a lot of people will find the encouragement. Mm. Because, you know, whilst we are on this side of heaven, we're still living in a sinful world. And yeah. a lot of things are going to happen in people's lives and in our lives. Mm. And this story will be one of the stories that is going to be encouraging to them. Praise the Lord. That, uh, that God is with us all the time Amen. in whatever uh, situation that we find ourselves Amen. in. There you have it, friends. I hope you were blessed by this episode as much as I was. If you were, Please remember to share this episode with your loved ones, your friends, and your families. And don't forget to subscribe, follow, like, and leave us a comment. Until next time, Maranatha.